This is Cambridge RGCC for Paper 4, Theory Extended. For May, June 2023, Paper 4, Variant 2. Question number one. A list of oxides A to H is shown. Answer the following questions about the oxides. Each letter may be used once, more than once, and not at all. Stage which of the oxides A to H is responsible for acid rain. That is, sulfur dioxide which is an acidic oxide produced by burning of coal amongst factories. So the and a giant covalent structure that is silicon four oxide commonly found in quartz and sand is a reducing agent in the blast furnace that is actually carbon monoxide. Right, uh, a lot of students will think that it's carbon uh, dioxide. No, it's carbon monoxide. Or some students even think that it's calcium oxide. No, no, no. It's carbon monoxide that is formed by burning of coke that forms carbon dioxide and more coke react with carbon dioxide and form carbon monoxide. And these carbon monoxides will react with your iron three oxides and form carbon dioxide and iron, which essentially this acts a reducing agent, removing oxygen from iron three oxide. So this one will be, let's see the letters. That's Reducing agent is H. Okay, it's the main constituent of bauxite. So that is aluminium oxide, Al2O3. Okay, B. Uh, it's the main impurity in iron ore. Iron ore is uh, what we call it. Main impurity is still silicon four oxide. In fact, all right, this is removed by using calcium carbonate, also known as limestone, where it thermally decomposes to calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. And calcium oxide here acts as a base that removes our silicon four oxide to form calcium silicate, also known as slag. Right? It's a neutralization reaction, in fact. And last one can be reduced by heating with copper. Oh, this must be very, very much. Uh, this metal must be less reactive than copper. So that should be silver oxide. Silver oxide. So uh, silver is, a, is less reactive than copper which means that copper can displace it from its ionic compound. So we get copper, two oxide, and silver. Okay, so the answer here is silver oxide. Okay, move on. Still the name given to group seven elements, halogens. Why does group seven elements have similar chemical properties? So similar chemical properties is due to they have the same number of valence electrons. So valence electrons are causing similar chemical are causing chemical properties. So because they have the C number, which leads them having similar chemical properties. Complete the table to show the color and state at room temperature, room temperature and pressure of some group seven elements. So it should be fluorine is gas, chlorine is also gas, bromine is a liquid, then iodine is a solid, not in the diagram. Then chlorine is also is yellowish green, yellowish green. Uh, pale yellow green. Bromine is reddish brown. Okay, bromine has two naturally occurring isotopes, bromine 79 and bromine 81. See the term given to the numbers 79 and 81 in these isotopes of bromine. So these are nuclear numbers. And complete the diagram below to show the protons, neutrons, and electrons in the atom and ion of bromine shown. So uh, proton, very easy. Proton essentially is the element number, atomic number. So bromine is element number 35. Okay, element number 35. Look at your periodic table. Find bromine. Bromide is element 35. Then neutrons simply just take the mass number, also known as the nuclear number, minus your proton number. You get 34. Wait, sorry, 44. And 46. And last thing is your electrons. So this is an atom because it's uncharged. So it means that proton and electrons are equal to each other. So 35 electrons. Whereas for this one, there's 35 protons, one negative uh, charge, which means that there will be 36 electrons. One more electron than proton. Okay, move on. Table shows the relative abundances of the two naturally occurring isotopes of bromine. So calculate the relative atomic mass of bromine to one decimal place. So actually, this relative atomic mass, it is similar to, uh, in mathematics, you have mean mass. All right, it's a similar formula. 
okay, a uh, sum of frequency times the object divided by sum of frequency. Okay, essentially, uh, the total abundance is hundred percent, right? So divide by hundred, then take the mass, multiply by the percentage individually, and sum them together. All right, sum sum the multiple of percentage times mass. So multiply these together, uh, punch these numbers in your calculator, and you should get seventy nine point nine. So uh, this is one decimal place seventy nine point nine. Okay, chlorine displaces bromine from aqueous potassium bromide, but does not displace chlorine from aqueous sodium fluoride. Write a simple equation for the reaction between chlorine and aqueous potassium bromide. Okay. Mm. Okay, okay. So we have chlorine displaces potassium bromide. And then essentially displacement occur where it forms potassium chloride and bromine. Bromine like aqueous depends on, I mean, most likely aqueous because it's water. So 2KBR, 2KCL, that's it. So first mark is on the equation, second mark is on balancing. Then two, state why chlorine does not displace fluorine from aqueous sodium fluoride because, because fluorine is more reactive than fluorine. Or you can also say uh, chlorine is less reactive than, uh, sorry, chlorine is less reactive than fluorine. Okay, next. Aqueous silver nitrate is a colorless solution containing silver, aqueous silver ions. Describe what is seen when aqueous silver nitrate is added to aqueous sodium chloride. So this is a precipitation reaction. You should know that silver and chloride, they, they together form a precipitate. This is a white precipitate. This is what you see. Please do not name it because describe what you see. Whereas what's the equation? So aqueous silver reacting with aqueous chloride forms your precipitate, which is a solid state, is a new chemical. This thing is white precipitate. These two looks invisible, whereas this is a white precipitate. Okay, next. What is the process used to manufacture sulfuric acid contact process? Part of the manufacture of sulfuric acid involves converting sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide. Describe two methods by which sulfur dioxide is obtained. So you can do this by burning of sulfur. Right or uh, roasting sulfide ores, of course, in the presence of air. Okay, the conversion of sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide is a reversible reaction which can reach equilibrium. State two features of equilibrium. An equilibrium happens when the concentration of reactants and products remain constant. Concentration of reactants and products remain constant. Okay, not because the reaction has stopped, but because the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backward reaction. Okay, still a typical condition and catalyst used in commercial sulfur dioxide to sulfur dioxide. So 450 degrees Celsius to 280 m, also known as 200 kPa. At least we use vanadium 5 oxide, right? Vanadium 5 oxide. And the letter 5 is important. The letter 5 is important. Okay, next. Complete the table to show the effect, if any, when the following changes are applied to the conversion. The forward reaction is exothermic. Only use the word increases, decreases, or no change. So, what we need to do is uh, look at rate first. It, that will be easier for you to do. Uh, this is just a tip which is do rate first, they only look at equilibrium. So rate, right? Temperature decreases, the rate should decrease. Pressure increases, rate increases, as you know, because more particles per volume, more frequent collisions, more frequent successful collisions. Whereas for concentration of SO3 on equilibrium, at equilibrium, temperature decreases will favor the exothermic reaction. So forward reaction is favored. The equilibrium position shift to the right, making more, more, sulfur trioxide then pressure increases so that favors the site with less gas so look at the left and the right this has three gas this has two gases so favor the site with less gas so 
increases, which is it shifts to the right. The equilibrium position shifts to the right while it favors the forward direction. And last one, no catalyst, no change on the concentration and equilibrium. Explain in terms of collision theory why reducing temperature decreases the rate of reaction. Okay, first of all, kinetic energy of particles decreases. Which makes them move slower, the particles move slower. So then you can talk about the, the frequency of collisions. Frequency of collisions decreases. Between reactant particles decreases. Frequency of successful collision. Uh, decreases. Now, uh, actually, in between these, you can also talk about because it's temperature. Temperature doesn't just affect the frequency of collisions, but it also decreases the, in a way, the intensity where they collide. So that actually causes a lot of collisions, right? There will be a lower percentage of collisions possessing energy. greater than the activation energy. It means that they collide less frequently, plus less, in a way, less harder. If you want to use an analogy, it's like hitting a ball, but with less force, less, uh, I would say, less momentum. So this causes the lower percentage of collision to, sorry, there will be a lower percentage of, percentage of collision that has the right energy to undergo a reaction. So total, these two things causes the frequency of collisions, successful collisions, decreases. Okay, next. Sulfuric acid contains SO4 2 minus. The oxidation number of O atoms in SO4 2 minus is minus 2. Determine the oxidation number of S atoms in SO4 2 minus. So this is, as you know, there's eight, eight oxygen atoms. So in total negative eight because h is negative two four makes negative eight so in order to create an overall oxidation number of negative two sulfur must be having positive six. Oh, show your working sorry show your working so uh, i will say maybe x plus four times minus two equals to negative two then i just need to do how uh, I mean, I will maybe I will call it let X be the oxidation number of S. Okay, so essentially the sum of oxidation numbers make, make it negative 2, so X will be positive 6. Okay, next, state what is meant by the term base? Base is just a proton acceptor. Take a term that, give, that we give to a base that dissolves to form an aqueous solution that is an alkali. See the color of thymophthalene in sodium hydroxide. This is blue in alkali. Blue in alkali. Next, complete the work equation for the reaction for sodium hydroxide with ammonium chloride. You should know that ammonium is actually acidic. So it's an acid-base reaction. You will form salt and water. So what will we form here? We will form sodium chloride and water. However, because this is an ammonium acid ammonium salt reaction, acidic ammonium salt with base reaction, you'll form an extra byproduct, which is ammonia gas. Okay, so it follows acid base salt water, but if it's ammonium, it forms ammonia. Okay, next, some metal oxides react with sodium hydroxide. State the term given to metal oxides which react with bases such as sodium hydroxide. That is an amphoteric oxide because because mostly metal oxides are basic. Bases don't react with each other. But if you have an amphoteric oxide, an amphoteric oxide is defined as an oxide that can react with both acid and alkali. So this is a special one, amphoteric oxide. So what is a metal oxide that reacts with sodium hydroxide? So in the syllabus, we mostly focus on aluminum oxide. There's another example, zinc oxide. Okay, uh, allow me, because this question, it asks you to name, so please name them, aluminium oxide, okay, or you can say zinc oxide. Okay, next question. 
Ethanoic acid is a weak acid. Complete a dot and cross diagram in a molecule of ethanoic acid. So, wow. Okay. Um, draw a simplified version for us to know what to draw. As you've already gone through organic chemistry, you should know that the structure of ethanoic acid looks like that. So each line represents two electrons. So we get one. Wait, allow me to use a different pen color. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Hmm. Then carbon, each carbon should have four. I mean, look at the diagram. It should be one, two, three, four. So one, oops. One, two, three, four. And then we have the dots, one, two. Then uh, oxygen, because it's a group six elements, it should have six outer shell electrons. So two used in bonding, the rest four is not used in bonding. And this thing goes to the bottom, so one, one. Then... Oxygen uses two electrons for bonding. Then le left with another. Four. Or you can do like this. Another way that I teach my students is to uh, do like a tally, like try to do it like accounting, which is to account for all, all uh, I would say, elements. So we have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So in terms of valence, carbon has four valence. Hydrogen has one valence. Oxygen has six valence. Electrons. Whereas they need, or should I say, they will share four electrons to achieve stable, stable electronic configuration. So this this is the remainder, which means lone pair, non-bonding electrons. So carbon should use four of them. Hydrogen uses one to achieve stable, stable noble gas electronic configuration. Whereas for oxygen, it will use two. So left with four. As you can see, it has four non-bonding electrons. Okay, next. Take the pH of dilute ethanoic acid. I believe it's around, it's a weak acid, you should know. So let's put six, six. It shouldn't be too low. Complete a simple equation to show the dissociation of ethanoic acid. So ethanoic acid should be a reversible reaction, all right? A reversible because weak acid dissociates partially. So you form an ethanoic ion, CH3COO minus, and a hydrogen ion, also known as a proton. Write an ionic equation for the reaction when an acid neutralizes a soluble base. So it will be hydrogen, red with hydroxide, forming water. Okay? An acid red with alkali has usually, in general, have this ionic equation, which is hydrogen ions, red with hydroxide ions, forming water. Okay, next. In a titration, 25 cubic centimeters of 0 0.08 molar aqueous potassium hydroxide is neutralized by 20 cubic centimeters of dilute sulfuric acid. Calculate the concentration of sulfuric acid in gram per cubic decimeters using the following steps. Let's record everything first. We have potassium hydroxide. We have sulfuric acid. For potassium hydroxide, we are given that. Let me use a different, different color. For potassium hydroxide, we are given that this is the dimension, this is the amount used. So what we need to do is to find number of moles. Number of moles, simply just take the molarity, which is also known as concentration, multiply by volume. So take 0 0.08, multiply by, don't forget, uh, in concentrations calculations, or should I say in volume calculations in stoichiometry, everything should be in cubic decimeters. So change this to cubic decimeter first which is 0 .02, 0 0.025. So multiply by 0 0.025, you will get uh, 0 0.002 mole, 0 0.002 mole. Then reduce the number of sulfuric acid which react with potassium hydroxide. So this is our recipe, our equation. Our equation gives us the mole ratio which is potassium hydroxide and sulfuric acid is reacting in a two to one manner. That's the mole ratio. So if we use 0 0.002, we will form 0 0.001. Okay, move on. Concentration of sulfuric acid in mole per cubic decimeters. 
So uh, by the unit itself, actually, you can realize that it's actually molar mole, sorry, number of moles divided by volume. So that means that means we take we take zero point zero zero one divided by zero point zero two. Uh, please change this to cubic decimeters as well. Then you will get you will get zero point zero five zero point zero five. Then calculate the concentration of sulfuric acid in gram per cubic decimeters. So given that it is in 0 0.05 mole per every cubic decimeters, how can we convert this to gram per cubic decimeters? As you can see, you need to introduce the units gram per mole. All right, you need to multiply gram so that you get gram. You, want to, you need to divide by mole so that you get rid of mole, leaving the final answer as gram per cubic decimeters, which means that you actually need to find the this unit tells, tells us about the molar mass. So molar mass of sulfuric acid is, based on your period table, 2 plus 32 plus 16 times 4. That should give you 98. So 98. Right. Let me check. Yep. And 0 0.05, that gets you 4.9 gram per cubic decimeters. Okay, move on. Propane and propane both react with chlorine. When a molecule of propane reacts with chlorine in the presence of UV light, one atom of hydrogen is replaced by one atom of chlorine. State the term given to reactions in which one atom in an alkane is replaced by another atom. This is substitution. When you see when you see alkanes, think of substitution. When you see substitution, think of alkanes. By the way, state the purpose of UV light in this reaction is to provide activation energy. The term given to any reaction that requires UV light, it's a photochemical reaction. What is a simple equation for the reaction between propane and chlorine? So propane is C3H8, chlorine is Cl2. So it's one by, it's a mono substitution, which means at each step, only one hydrogen will get this, will get substituted. So C3H7, Cl, and the byproduct is HCl because the H uh, we'll be forming a bond with the remaining chlorine atom. Next question, a molecule of propene is unsaturated and will react with chlorine at room temperature. State why propene is an unsaturated molecule because it contains a contains a carbon-carbon double bond. Okay, it contains a carbon-carbon double bond, uh, also known as, which is not a single bond. Okay. Give the structural formula of the product in this reaction. So this is this is chlorine with an alkene. Alkene carries out addition reaction. Addition reaction really is just adding them together. So you get C3H6Cl2. Alright, C3H6Cl2. Or you can actually, if you want, oh wait, 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 no, no, no. This is the molecular formula. Sorry. If you want to draw the structural formula, you will have to. You will have to talk about the position of the chlorine here. So you can write CH3, CH2Cl, CH3, CH2Cl, CH2Cl. So okay, how 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 do you know how do you know how to write? Essentially, each division is by carbon. So first carbon surrounded by three hydrogens. Second carbon, oops, yeah, that's why I double check. Is surrounded by a hydrogen and a chlorine. The third carbon is surrounded by two hydrogen and one chlorine. Okay, next question. Propene undergoes addition reaction with steam. There are two possible products, A and B. Draw the display formula and name each product. Okay, propene is looks like this. Right. So Addition of steam means adding uh, water in, of course, in gases form. It can form either, because water is composed of H and OH, so it can either form, it can either form propane 2 O, or the OH can go to the first, the OH can go to the first carbon. So it forms something like this. And make sure your line aligns to O. Aligns to O. 
So this is dropping to O. Hey, no, no, sorry, dropping one O. Okay, the first one is dropping two O, the second one is dropping one O. Okay, next, carboxylic acids can be converted to esters. Name the ester form when butanoic acid reacts with ethanol. So first name ethanol, second sorry, first name alcohol, change it to alcohol. Second name carboxylic acid, change it to oic acid. So it will be ethyl butanoic. Ethyl butanoic. Identify the other product form in this reaction, which is water. All right, because it's a condensation reaction. And ester, esterification is actually a type of condensation reaction in which there will be a small molecule removed. And then in this case, we are removing a water. Deduce the empirical formula of the ester form. Okay, so for esters, okay, we can actually write down the formula for ethyl butanoic first. Then we can just condense them together to form the empirical formula. So ethyl butanoic is. The first part is C2H5, which is ethyl, then uh, O, C, double bond O, and this is C3H7. So all together, C6, C6H12O2. Is that correct? Is that correct? C3H12O2. Or you can do like this, do, you know, butanoic acid formula. You see 4H9, C, C3, H9, C3, H7, COOH, C2, H5, OH. So add together, you form, wait, am I making a mistake? No, uh, C6, H12, H14, O3, take away water. You form C6H12O2. C6H12O2. So the empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio. So we get C3H6O. C3H6O. Next, PD2 is a polyester. Circle one repeating unit of this polymer. So the repeating unit is, as you can see, actually, you can see from the diagram what is repeating. C double bond O O, I mean two two uh, carboxylic, sorry, di carboxylic acid residue. It's really remove O H, and then we have this di O residue already remove H. So that's that's the that's the repeating unit. Uh, I mean circle, circle. So let's follow the instruction. Circle. Okay, then draw the structure of the monomers which make up PUT. So simply just, simply just, uh, I mean, essentially, first step, if of course, is to mimic what's happening. Mimic what ha what's happening. Okay, second step is know that this is condensation polymer, which means that condensation polymer, it would have water. So you put back an OH and H, that forms the monomers. So it's a dicarboxylic acid group and a diol group. State the type of polymerization to make PVT. So this is condensation polymerization. Okay, that's it for this for this discussion. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.